Hey, everyone. I want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian in crypto and provider of prime services. They're also one of my favorite companies in the space. So thank you very much to Copper for making this episode possible. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Today, I am joined, as always, by my surprised co-host, because I've got a surprise for you this week, Mark. <laughs> What's going on? I thought you meant I looked surprised already. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, what's going on? How's before I get into it? How's your week? What'd you get up to? It was to? good. It was good. You know, it, it's hard to believe January is over. I mean, just unbelievable how fast, you know, the, the year has, has gone. So just, uh, I got a lot of things to talk about today, actually. Um, so got surprises. I got, I got, I got lots of stuff. I got my free guy outfit, um, from, from the movie, if you haven't seen it, but, uh, quick Sorry, reveal. Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds. So I got yeah, I got Bitcoin Orange, Bitcoin Friday. But I have an important pair of socks. I have the Bitcoin Citadel. All right. And that's not an advertisement for Ken Griffin. Um, it is it's an anomaly, no, no, an analogy for for what's been going on in our world, in the crypto world. So someone tweeted at me, right, uh, as the ETFs are being approved. So, you know, we we won, right? You know, you've been talking about the then they fight you phase. Like, uh-uh. We won a skirmish. And it's like the medieval days of, of walled cities and castles and citadels. And so, yeah, the troops, you know, the bad guys from, from uh, the SEC, et cetera, came out and... We had a skirmish and, and we won and they retreated back behind the walls, but they threw up a bunch of other barriers and said, okay, you, you Citadel down the road at, 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 uh, at Vanguard, none of your clients can buy this. And Hey, you bank of America, you tell your Merrill Lynch people, you can't tell your people to buy. It. And so we still haven't won. And my homework assignment for everybody listening. And, and by the way, thank you for listening. Um, as we share our Saturday cup of coffee, the homework assignment is make the audience bigger. Send a link to this podcast or any other piece of work like lop.net or, or anything else that can help educate the people that are locked inside those Citadel walls. We need to get them out joining us. And uh, so three people, no coiners, uh, who need some education, send them a link to this podcast. And, and I think that'll help. We just did, you know, us talking to each other, it's fine. It's good, but we need a, a much bigger audience. So in that vein of a uh, bigger audience, so this was my surprise for you, but when we go to DAS this year, we are officially organizing a night before hang for on the margin listeners who are going to London. There we gonna go. It. It's going to be a blast. This is going to be me and Mark hanging out in a pub. They do the roast, the Sunday night roast. Um, and we might even do a little live talk or something like that. And we're also going to have Jason and Santi from Empire. So it's going to be a nice little Oh, so good. Uh, so good. Yeah. They've got the pub culture over there. That is one of the best things about the city. They've got the museums. They've got a beautiful city. They've got all the best stuff from, you know, Greece and all these other lands that they borrowed for a little bit of time and then borrowed. they've also got yeah. pub culture yeah borrowed borrowed yeah. and won't give back pretty unpopularly but uh but they do have a lot of really great stuff over there and it's very cool city. well they're like we, we found this stuff it was just lying on the ground i mean possession is nine tenths of the law so you know exactly and, exactly yeah. and and then they're like and we invented this common law stuff property rights is is all about us i mean look around the world like watch like what we're gonna invent this thing called the uh, property laws and common law here's the first example of the shit that we took from here that's right the we're stuff that we it. found we just found it yeah. yeah hey everyone we'll be back to the program in just a moment but before we return wanted to let you know about das london das london is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto hosted by blockworks but i want to give you an update because we are now 10 times oversubscribed for this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. 
Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs, from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of the Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark, uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, I do have a, a, a quick congratulations as well to uh, Apple and Microsoft, which both entered the three bill- or three trilly club three trilly. Uh, this week. Yeah. And Meta made it to the one, one trillion. So there are six companies uh at a trillion dollars sadly you know we, we have to we have to talk about the the uh the people going the other way sadly uh tesla <laughs> went the other way and uh their ascent toward a trillion is i think permanently impaired i i think it's it's kind of over there for that that stock not the company but um you know they sowed the seeds of their own demise i don't know if you saw the tweet but the decimation in the EV space, like all the publicly listed EV companies, I mean, Tesla is like the best, and it's only down like forty four percent. You know, the worst are down ninety nine point nine nine percent. And I think, you know, people finally figured it out. It's going to take a long time for, and and actually, it's never going to happen. No one is going to be completely dependent on electric vehicles. It's just just not. It's just not practical. Well, so, all right. So I, I actually want to get your your thoughts on what happened to Tesla stock because that has been the Teflon stock for such a long period of time. I mean, how many guys have gotten carted out shorting that thing? I actually remember a family friend who worked at Coinos, Jim Chanos' fund, and I was on a, a train with her back in like, I mean, it must have been 2016, 2017. Yeah. Like, we're real short this one name. Yep. Tesla. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, that was the wrong thing to be short back then. But there, you know, any number of things between now and then could have made that stock go down, but it's just been a one-way rocket ship up. So I'm very curious to get your take. I will push back a little bit on, I'm actually going to try to find this this data, but uh, you know, on the EV thing, I, you know, I saw, so people were, I saw this on my feed this week, people were tweeting about, oh, look at the Ford F-150 EV. They're stopping production of that. And from my perspective, I was sitting there being like, yeah, that was the wrong call in the beginning. Who's buying Ford F-150s? People that don't give a shit if it's electric or not. So I I, I don't know. I, no, no, I no, think- but that, that's the point, right? I said, we have, we have one of each, right? I have a little Kia EV because I drive four miles to my office and back. And, <laughs> and, but, you know, and we talked about this maybe last week or the week before when it was super cold here, you know, my 260 mile range shrunk down to 170. I mean, it's crazy what happens in in the cold weather. In fact, my it, the car wouldn't even finish charging. I get these messages in the middle of the night charging interrupted because it was too cold. So, I I just think there are there are places where a limited range vehicle makes sense. But if you're out in the middle of nowhere, Montana, I don't mean the middle of nowhere in a bad sense. I just mean literally there's not a lot around no charging stations, not even really gas stations. You need a big old vehicle with a big old tank of gas that you can do your work. It's just very early days, I think is is my point on on it is. EV. And, and it's gonna take a long time. And and well, so you ask the question, what's happened with the stock? Gravity. Yeah. Right? Gravity. Gravity is immutable. It is a force, it is a law, you know. It is immutable. Now, you can suspend disbelief in the markets for periods of time, and sentiment can get ahead of the law. And but eventually, the law works. And that's you know Jim Chanos and and you know, we just did a great webinar yesterday with Chris Hansen, who runs a firm called Valiant, and he worked at Blue Ridge for John Griffin, one of the great short sellers of all time, and just talked about short selling. And and look, from 2009 to 2022, 
short selling was basically banned yeah. by the government, right? By the Fed. QE is the reason. QE is the reason for Tesla crushing the shorts, for NVIDIA crushing the shorts, for all of these companies that that have gotten to levels that don't make sense. You, you just look at them and you say, well, okay, when, when Tesla was about to go bankrupt, right? They were down to their last kind of billion dollars in the bank and they were struggling to raise money. This was kind of the, the Thanksgiving before lockdowns. And they got this big, you know, announcement from Morgan Stanley. And I love it. They always made these announcements on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right. When there's just nobody working, because that's how you can do a, a short squeeze. And that's when he said, you know, Elon tweeted about his short, I'm going to get the short shorts and he was selling the short shorts. And, and, and he engineered one of the great short squeezes of all time. And, and that's real, right? That that's as real as anything else. But in the end, they did get to profitability. But now the problem is trees don't grow to the sky. Gravity is the growth rate was really high, and now it's coming down. And there was there's this I love there was this woman on on TV uh, yesterday or the day before uh, from Morgan Stanley, and and she's trying to recreate as people are known to do reality so historically there's been something called pe price to earnings right and you pay a certain price for an amount of earnings and she's like no 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 that doesn't apply anymore it's now p to e to g now there's always been something called the peg ratio pe to growth and and the logic kind of logic was well you can pay more if the growth rate's higher. Okay, that, that is logical, except that's assuming that the growth rate stays high forever. And if you look at any company in the history of mankind, and that's a big statement, but look at all, earnings growth does not continue to go up. It doesn't even continue to go up and stay flat. It goes up and then it crests and then it goes up. numbers. It's just the law of large numbers. I mean, yeah. Apple, this is a crazy thing. Apple, for the last eight years, their revenues are up 60%, six zero. So over eight years, you know, about five, 6% revenue growth. Their stock is up 600%. Why? Because the multiple that people are willing to pay it went from a you know, 15 multiple to a 33 multiple. Why? Why would you pay more for a stock that's growing less? Because Warren owns it. And because they buy back shares, so they, they create an illusion of faster growth in earnings per share. So what happened to Tesla, for years, they would surprise on earnings by selling credits. They got special treatment. They were allowed to sell credits. Uh, for environmental things, or they get some mystery, uh, you know, deal with their suppliers, or or they get to you know open a, a factory in China. That oh my god, that was hilarious. Elon Musk saying we better do something about these Chinese EV manufacturers, or they're gonna I'm like, dude, sixty percent of Teslas are made in China. Don't don't act like they're some foreign competitor. You you are them. You know, it's like the old Pogo uh, cartoon. I've seen the enemy and he is us. So anyway. Yeah. And the reason that we're, that you and I are talking about uh, Tesla specifically right now is they had an earnings call this past week and it was a bad miss both on revenue and profitability, but really what people care about when it comes to Tesla, because to your point, it's the G, it's a growth story. And they warned that uh, next year, 2024, was going to be even a slower year than they were expecting. They didn't give a target. So, yeah, the stock has sold off, you know, 25% or something yeah. like that. So, and you know, here's here's an analogy, though, to to uh, one thing that I noticed, you know, as a non-professional observer of this. I, I, I've talked before about how I my, the first stock that I owned and watched very closely was Netflix. And there was a moment, there were two moments that, that convinced me to, I uh, really, I guess, three that convinced me to eventually sell, which was one, 
um, they they were all about international subscriber growth. And at one point, they just had like 200 million subscribers, and they're mostly families. So it's like, how many families are there in the world? Like, they can't keep doing printing these numbers. Uh, but the other thing was they uh, they they announced gaming. But the third thing was there was a period of time when there were all these streaming sites that launched as copies. It was Disney Plus, yep. Apple, Peacock. Yep. And as a subscriber, I just remember thinking, this sucks. I like they're, you know, eventually people are going to have to make choices in between these. And I was just, you know, there, there didn't used to really be choice, but now there's a lot of choice. This happened the last Super Bowl. Do you remember every single car company had their EV product? Yes. And I just remember thinking, you know, probably not all of these are going to be wildly successful, nope. but some of them will. And yeah. now Tesla is no longer the only game in town. So yeah, to your point, you know, you know the, the Kia EVs are amazing. They're not, they're not as prevalent as, as the Tesla and you know, Tesla's doing great. I mean, they're doing great in the sense of they build a great product. The problem, there's a difference between a great product, a great company and a great stock. And there are lots of examples, right? History is replete with examples of stocks that get ahead of themselves. And, you know, the newest one is, is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a great company. It's one of the all-time great companies. But it's having its Cisco moment. So Cisco was the company in Web1, in Internet1. And from the early 90s to, to 2000, uh, it, it rocked. Right. I mean, it was the darling and and the short sellers, they got carted out. They kept saying, but 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 they, they, they can't grow like this forever. To your point, how many how many network pe are people in the world are there that can buy Cisco stuff? I mean, they've already bought it all. And as it turned out, at one point, they got to a level of two hundred and eighty six times earnings. So for every dollar of earnings they made, people were willing to spend $286. And if you do that math, if you pay $286 for a dollar, you have to live to be like 413 to make a 10% return. Most of us are not going to live to be 413. I will venture to say all of us are not going to live to be 413. So that, what happened? Stock went down 80 something percent. And today, 23 years later, it's still down about 35% from where it was. Now, NVIDIA isn't quite 286 because uh, they had a big earnings blowout uh, last quarter when pretty much everybody, mostly Google and, and a couple others, said, that chip, I, I need that chip. So they're replacing CPUs with GPUs, all to do this, this AI thing. And long story short, that they had a really, really good quarter. But now what people are doing is they're extrapolating that growth forever, linearly. That's just not going to happen. AMD is going to compete. There's going to be upstarts. There are going to be other companies, like ones that we're actually investing in early stage venture. They're designing things that they want to compete with them. So the same way that NVIDIA basically replaced Intel, and I don't know if you saw Intel yesterday, boom like off the cliff, almost as bad as Tesla. Because it turns out if people don't, if they're buying GPUs, they don't need as many CPUs. So at the end of the day, um, trees don't grow to the sky and you can't build castles in the air, right? So to speak. And uh, I feel like we should be playing 60s music in the background now. So. Hey, everyone. Wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian and provider of prime services within digital assets. Today, what I want to talk to you specifically about is Clearloop. Clearloop is a solution from Copper, which to me solves one of the biggest problems for market makers, high frequency traders, hedge funds within digital assets. You know the exquisite pain of what I call the pre-funding problem. So if you want to take advantage of arbitrages that pop up across different exchanges, or you just have a tra trading strategy, which requires you to be active on multiple different centralized exchanges, you have to pre-fund your account at each one of those exchanges. Now, this is not ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. One, you have to take counterparty risk from those exchanges, which as we saw this last year can have major consequences. Two, it's capital inefficient. You have a whole bunch of assets spread out there. Most of them are not doing anything most of the time. 
And three, it's just not great from a workflow standpoint and it creates administrative overhead. So enter Clearloop. Clearloop is the secure MPC custody solution provided by Copper. The way that it works is you deposit your assets into this MPC solution, which is owned and, owned and operated by you. Clearloop syncs up with a whole bunch of your favorite exchanges, and then you can trade securely from Clearloop itself while not taking any counterparty exchange risk with any of these exchanges. And it's a super easy and nice UX. Now, Clearloop is trusted by the likes of Flow Traders, Brevin Howard, Nickel, some of the best in the business. But the coup de gras is in the extreme edge case that one of these exchanges were to go bankrupt, they have a very clever trust structure which segregates your assets and keeps you completely protected. So click the link at the bottom of this episode, especially if you're a hedge fund and market maker and you wanna learn more or better yet, Dimitri, the CEO is actually going to be in person on a panel hosted by yours truly at Digital Asset Summit. So Das London, that's March 18th to the 20th in London. So you should definitely click the link at the bottom of this episode, give your boy some credit, but also even better, come to Das London and hear from Dimitri himself. All right, cheers everyone. I want to get your your take, Mark. One of the things that actually surprised me this week, and I think a lot of it caught a lot of other people on their back foot as well, which is that the Federal Reserve is going to end the BTFP which was pretty surprising. And yeah. I definitely said this as well. But, you know, there's, this is kind of the old quote that there's no such thing as a temporary, uh, nothing quite so permanent as a temporary government program. But this ended up not being the case with the BTFP. And the BTFP, for just to catch listeners up who might be less familiar with it, the Bank Term Funding Program, this is a program that the Fed put in place in, I believe, March of last year, when we had our mini banking crisis. And the idea is that banks can take uh, some of their assets, so treasuries for the most part, um, or I believe MBS, mortgage-backed securities, might be included in that as well. Yep. And if it's trading below par, they can essentially, they're going to, you know, they can pledge it as collateral and get par value back. So it's basically a, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, an attempt to shore up the, the balance sheet of the banks. It was probably also, from the perspective of the Fed, a, a form of, this is me editorializing here, but a soft form of yield curve control, not in the sense that they're going out into the market and buying bonds, but they're trying to convince banks not to sell their bonds, which has the net same effect. And it looks like they are winding that program down this week. So, Mark, what do you think about that? Did you expect to, did you expect to see this? I, I did not. I, I'm, I'm with you on this, that uh, I thought this temporary program would, would have to be permanent. Um, you know, look, we are going to ent- re-enter QE. That that's coming. You know, QT is over. Um, they're going to go. This was a stealth way of doing QE. Well, this is not QE. We're just lending these banks some money temporarily while their assets accrete back to par because these are money good, right? The government's not going to default because the government can just go print more money. It's like the old Doritos commercial, crunch all you want, you know, we'll make more. And I, I, I think the problem that I see here is 30% of bank equity. And, you know, we had, was it Jim? Bianco? Somebody, somebody we had on, on the show uh, last year who had the great chart of bank balance sheets. And it had the green as the assets and the red as the liabilities and the gold was the equity. And, you know, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. That's how accounting works. Well, the problem is if you bought these assets and they became impaired because you you bought them at low interest rates and interest rates rose and now there's an impairment, the way the accounting works is those unrealized losses are part of equity. Well, but if they're losses, then shouldn't they detract from the equity value? But the the thought is, well, but they're not real losses. They're just unrealized because they're going to be money good. And that's somewhat compelling as long as there's not a bank run, right? Because the, the challenge for all of banking, fractions are banking and, you know, Caitlin and others rail against this all the time, is functionally bankrupt. It's a bankrupt business model, right? If everybody showed up to the bank and said, I want my money, you couldn't 
satisfy the demand and the bank would, would be out of business. And so time is your ally. It's like the opposite of, of the Maverick scene, right? Time is your greatest enemy. Time is your ally. Because if, if you can be given time to not have to pay out the depositors or that's why you shut your doors or, or could do a bank holiday. Um, but I, I so long-winded way of saying, I didn't expect them to stop this. But what, what we did see is the bank balance sheet, the, Q, the uh, Fed balance sheet ticked back up. So they were actually reducing the balance sheet like he said he was going to a year ago. And that's over. And, and this is the 2007 moment for the U.S. And what I mean by that is in 2007, the Bank of Japan said, no more QE. We're going to stop QQE. And here we are 16 years later and they have, or 17 years later, and they have, you know, almost twice the amount of bonds on their balance sheet. And, um, you know, who, there, was a, there was a tweet going around yesterday on Twitter about uh, Ray Dalio talking about this, that functionally what happens when a currency starts to devalue <clears throat> is government essentially has to go print a bunch of money in the central banking facility and buy up all of the excess bonds. And you know, you've know, you been talking about this for a while with, with this wild deficit spending. You know, everybody was celebrating yesterday, you know, the great GDP number in Q4. Like, sure, give me half a trillion dollars. I'll show you a good time too. $500 billion spent in Q4 that we didn't have. Yeah, you can make GDP look really nice. So fiscal illusion is similar to monetary illusion and 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 it's it's the boiling frog problem right you just keep thinking it's all going to work out and then you realize wait a minute why am i paying you know 18 dollars for a hamburger and and why is gasoline costing four dollars a gallon and why is that plane ticket costing seven hundred dollars instead of three hundred dollars that's because your money isn't as good as it used to be because they had to print more of it to fund these deficits. I agree with you. I agree with you. Now, what do you, Mark, what do you think about how did, how is this going to impact QT? I'd be very curious. And I, I think, you know, we talked about this a little while. We had Andy on the program a couple of months back when the QRA was moving markets. And it feels like, so we've got a quarterly refunding announcement coming up this next week. We've also got the FOMC. And I, I have a feeling that we, we had a couple of uh, treasury auctions this week that were, you know, they're never going to be every once in a while, you know, someone will get up on their soapbox and say, there's going to be a failed auction. And what I would point out to people is that that's not really possible with the system right. of right. primary dealers that we have in the US. The whole idea of being a primary dealer is that you're a market maker for. Yeah, you're that. forced, you're forced to, to, to truncate the tails. And Andy talked about this, I think he even tweeted it that, um, there was an auction that was bad. It wasn't failed. It wasn't a tail because those primary dealers have to buy no matter what. Um, but if you ranked it between, you know, four and and nine, it was a four. I mean, it was it was ugly. And so does that mean the end of the world? No. Does it mean that we are we're reaching a point that is Again, unsustainable. Yeah. And and everyone's seen the, the chart. And I wish someone would fix the chart crime. You can't show a 40, 50, 60 year chart in linear scale. You just can't do it. It's it's so egregious. And what it shows is, you know, here's the interest on debt, and then the expectations in the next three years, it goes totally vertical. Like, no, because the difference from going from zero to a trillion is very different than going from one trillion to two trillion. It, it just is. And yes, that next trillion is a lot, but the percentage growth is is not the not the same. And so they just they just need to fix those charts. But 
But things that can't happen won't happen. Right? So if if the you know, we're at the point now where the interest expense as a percent of the budget is reaching the upper bound that it's never reached, that 21% level. So you say, well, why won't it go to 30 or 40 or 50%? If rates are higher today and we got to refinance all this debt that was, you know, has zero rates or 1% rates and now it's going to refinance at four or five, then then the interest rate is going to go beyond that. Nope. I mean, they'll they'll either, right, buy the bonds and retire them, right? Do some sort of debt jubilee. They'll uh they will lower interest rates, despite the fact that we don't need lower interest rates unless there's an emergency. But there is an emergency. So it's just a different kind of emergency. And in the death throes of empires, this is what happens. And we've been talking about this a lot. And and it doesn't happen over a month or a year. It happens over a reasonable period of time. Now, looking back in history, it seems like it was you know instantaneous, but it's not instantaneous. But I, I said I've, I've been doing a little reading about Weimar. There are some scary similarities, very scary similarities to Weimar. And I'm not saying we're all going to have wheelbarrows of cash. I'm not there yet, but I, I there are there are some scary similarities. There are. Yeah, I've been this. This uh, this podcast I listen to, I show all the time. The rest is history. I've also been listening to, actually, the the rise of they actually they've they've, they've done eight total episodes. The ri- early rise of the Nazi Party, starting in kind of nineteen twenty yep. to nineteen thirties, and then the early reign of the Nazi parties pre the initiation of World War Two. So I think sort of early mid thirties. Yeah, it's not great. And I, I've what I've always sort of thought is again, this is where I think. Sometimes people with a deep knowledge of finance and people that don't understand finance talk past each other. And I do think the people that don't understand finance have it more right than the people that deeply understand it. Because, you know, the way that someone who doesn't deeply understand finance is, hey, look at all this debt. This feels like a problem. And then the people who understand finance is, no, 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 no. The U.S. is the issuer of the world reserve currency. We have more demand for our debt today than we've ever had. Look at look at the demand for all of our yield bearing money, which is debt, yep. which is treasuries. Yep. You don't understand that some people actually. And by the way, we could print more money. And again, on the short term, they have much more like technical uh, and and te- technical understanding to marshal these arguments. But in the long term, of course, that's not correct because it's never been uh, correct. Uh, for absolutely, and, and and the and, smarter. And even in, even if you can architect a system where you can create a perpetual motion machine or divide gravity for a, a, for a certain period of time, you cannot do it forever. Eventually, there is some kind of, imagine a factory or an engine, and you're constantly trying to patch something up, but eventually this jet of steam is going to burst out. And where is it bursting out? It's not bursting out actually in the financial system. It is bursting out socially across the world. Like yeah. just look at what's just look at what's going on and happening right now. I mean, yeah, well, on, on the gravity thing, right? Frightening yeah. elections going on all over yeah. the world, and it is because of this. That is what is causing all of this. And of course, it's it's about populism, right? And yeah, populism right. rises. That's the gas populism gas. rises when people are are disenfranchised and unhappy and and getting poor, and you know the have fun staying poor thing that that all the crypto people talk about. That ain't it. It's it's literally the government saying. We're in the castle, you're not, and you you have fun being serfs and peasants and, and working for us. Ms. Kelton, right? Stephanie Kelton, the you know, the cult of Kelton, the, the MMTers, the modern monetary theories, which is basically just modern modern monetary theft. It's just more inflation to steal your wealth. In 2013, tweeted that Bitcoin was worthless. Literally, it was going to zero. I think the price was $650. And proving once again that she can't do math, which is kind of ironic given that people think she's some guru, but economics is a voodoo science. It isn't about math most of the time. I mean, supply and demand are, but but that's not what she's talking about. She came up with this crazy theory that 
as long as you are the world reserve currency, you can issue as much debt as you want, and it does not matter. Well, no, hun. What is Bitcoin today? 41,000 instead of 650. Well, did Bitcoin grow? Like, did a, Bit did a single Bitcoin get bigger? No. Did it get more efficient? No. One Bitcoin has always been one Bitcoin. But what happened? The money that you told everyone to print got worse. That's it. And I, I was talking about this the other day with somebody. It's not just here, to your point. It's Argentina. They just elected, I mean, I love him. Maybe, maybe. He might be so crazy that I like him. But can I, can, so I don't want to make this a political thing, but there is a certain cadre of people that I'm starting to notice. And it's, they're across, first of all, all wealthy people, all wealthy people for the most part. And they have this similar kind of unhinged vibe that I'm, that I'm not really here for. And the reason I'm personally not here for it is because, is because it makes me worry about these trends of populism in history where you can go back and look. And if I had to sum up the situation, there is a group of people who've been in charge for a long time who have lost the pulse. They, they've lost the pulse. I, and this is where you and I disagree a little bit. I personally think they just got fat and happy and lazy. And, and the institutions that we built no longer work and serve the people. But yeah, I they, think they're sinister. But OK, yeah, that's, that's all right. But it, 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 at the end of the day, it actually doesn't really matter. It's the same result, right? It, result. A lot of people, the, the structures that we have in place don't serve our society anymore. And there is this group of people who've noticed that and are being particularly bombastic about it. And I am sort of unconvinced that these people actually have everyone's best interest at heart. And they're more in the camp of, hey, I'm just, I've noticed this. This is an end. They have absolutely, positively do not have yours and my best interest at heart. But here's the thing. When Mile talks, I love it. He actually speaks to truth in terms of, you know, government waste and the Kirsch. I mean, the, look, it's easy to pick on Argentina because the Kirshnerites were just, and the Peronists were, they decimated what was at one point the third most prolific country in the world a hundred years ago. Think about that. Argentina was number three. Like, how did they squander that? Greed, populism, and, and you know, a, a series of bad uh, elected, you know, bought, right? You know, how did how the parents get elected? They said, hey, Mike, I see you're having trouble paying your electricity bill. How about free electricity? But you got to vote for us, okay? So we give you free electricity, you vote for us? Okay. I know it's a tragedy of the commons type thing because what populists are really good at is identifying what people actually need, but they don't propose solutions that ultimately <laughs> in the long run end up making sense. No, but they just buy votes. I they know. just buy it's... votes. Maduro in, in Venezuela, you know, Erdogan in, in Turkey. Imagine being a Turkish citizen in the last two years mm. and trying to live while the lira goes like this, right? What should you have done? You should have done that, right? You should have converted your lira to Bitcoin and your value of your assets would be higher. If you were in Venezuela, you should have converted your um, bolivars into Bitcoin or Dash or Monero or anything else. And some did, and some have survived. Um, but the, the ability for populist governments to destroy everything. Venezuela was one of the most productive oil producing countries in the world 20 years ago. It just was. Yes, yeah, pretty bananas to think about. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I want to bring us back to markets here, actually. And I want to, I, here's here, what I want to get your take on is so after we had, so this week we had a little bit of a hiccup in the stock market. And you and I have talked about this uh, a couple of times. So I don't want to, almost like over overplay this, but it's it's just, it would be very poetic, right? I'm gonna share my screen. So this is this is the chart of uh, what Bitcoin did in 2021 through 2020, 
uh, or basically 2021 through 2022. You can see it went through it for its first kind of little bubble here. Um, and then it looked like we had a blow off top. And then we went all the way back up and we made new highs, barely, barely new highs, barely. right? From about 63,000 to 67,000, which is another like 6% or something like that. Now look at this chart. <laughs> this, is, this is the S&P. This yeah. is the S&P just delayed. And it's, it's almost the same. So the, the new high that we've had, um, which we've since rolled off, is another 3%. It would just be very poetic in a sense because my, my framework for a long time has just been that crypto leads um, you know, liquidity expectations. And that's what I feel like the stock market is trading on as well. So, yeah. And we're sort of at this point where, I don't know, I view it as an inflection point. We're right on the cusp of making all-time highs. We just barely made all-time highs in the stock market again, but it doesn't look like we're roaring forward. If anything, it feels like things are about to get bumpier. And going back to this, this, this is, this is non-scientific, right? There's so, you know, this is, take this all with a massive grain of salt here, right? I'm not doing uh, any scientific work, but it would just be interesting to me if, if no, but uh, you're, you, 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 it, it's, it, it has a scientific base. So what drove that first move from 10K to 60K? Okay, liquidity. Well, what do you mean, Mark? Well, GBTC had, had just kind of become de rigueur and people were talking about it and a bunch of money went in. And a bunch of money went into a small asset and <clears throat> demand went up and, and we went from 10 to 60 in a heartbeat because about by, by, by my estimates, about 10-ish billion in an asset that was trading about 2 billion a day went in and we went up. And then Elon famously tweeted, well, we don't like it anymore. So you can't buy your Tesla with, with, uh, with it. And I might sell some of it out of Tesla and because he had to pay some bills um, and it crashed. And then liquidity went the other way. Right, because people were like, "Oh, I'm out," and so, but then by summertime, people are like, "Well, hmm, it didn't go away," and um, I kind of like this asset, and the having had occurred, and remember what the having does is it it reduces supply, so there are two types of things that will drive price, right? Yeah, your supply and demand curve. You can increase demand. Right? So if you increase demand, if you shift the aggregate demand curve, the price goes up. P0, P1 is higher than P0. Second thing you can do is you can shift supply. You can restrict supply. So if you have a demand surge, GBTC, and a supply cut, what happens? Price goes up. So... But then what happens, and we talked about this, is when the price is below fair value, investors buy. That's what investors do. They buy things below fair value. Then what happens is as the price starts to move, the traders come in. And the traders don't really care about value. They just, they just want movement. So they start. And you know, as the price keeps moving up, more traders come in, more buyers come in, great. And that actually attracts some new capital into to the asset, whatever shiny asset that is. Well, then the speculators and the gamblers come in. Well, who are they? Well, they're the people that come in, they don't give a crap about anything. And just a number go up, I'm in. And I'm doing it with leverage. And back then, you could still get a hundred times leverage. I mean, I've told this story on the show. I shouldn't pick on my brother, but my brother called me after the, the collapse and uh, said, hey, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I put it a bit, I'm like, stop. You levered an 80 vol asset a hundred times. You got a margin call. You couldn't make it. That's not stealing. That's the way the world works. And if you had done that with, you know, uh, Cisco stock in 2000 or Microsoft stock or, which actually happened, or Amazon stock, you know, it went down 94%. Lots of people got liquidated. And that's why they're so sharp. It's this unwinding of the leverage that causes those sharp downdrafts. And so then you get 
all the way, you go past fair value, you go all the way down to the depths and everybody's like, oh, I hate this. It's never going to go back up. And then quietly the investors come back and that's why you have these cycles. And so where are we today? So we have for, for equities, we had the rise and then people said, well, in, no, in November of 21, they're like, the numbers don't add up. Get out, get out. And the Fed took liquidity away. And so people are getting liquidated. And so, well, then in October of last year, what happened? They actually increased liquidity. They didn't cut rates. But if you look at liquidity measured by cross-border capital and others and, and the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, we're loose, looser today than any time in the previous 10 years. And so that massive wave, and part of it was China and, and a bunch of other things, but, but the bottom line was liquidity flooded back in and the gamblers are back. And the short sellers got squeezed. Short sellers since October lost about $185 billion trying to be short the Magnificent Seven because they're looking at these things going, these things are growing single digits and they're going up double digits, triple digits. Doesn't make sense. But if you try to short something that is in this mania phase, you will get taken out. And I won't necessarily compare NVIDIA to MicroStrategy, but go back to 2000 and look at MicroStrategy's chart. Started $3, went to 100 they carried out all the shorts. Then it went to 200 they carried out all the shorts. Then it went to 330 something and everybody said, oh my God, it's going to the moon. And then went right back to three. And then you get fined by the SEC and a bunch of other stuff. But the reality is, when it breaks, it breaks hard. So flipping from equities, I think the double top in equities, right on, perfect analogy. I would be very skeptical of, of holding U.S. equities here. And the forward-looking returns are, are very low. Bitcoin, on the other hand, we're just getting warmed up. The halving is three months away. That supply shock is real. And we had a little hiccup in the last couple of weeks because everybody thought, well, as soon as the ETFs, $300 billion is coming in. Nope. We got five. That is a lot. But we didn't really get five because GBTC made a decision to keep fees high. So, so they lost roughly an equivalent amount. And so we haven't had the net inflow yet. And those you know, overlords- that well. Almost a billion. Of yeah, you know, which is great, which is great. But that billion is going to turn into 10, is going to turn into 30. And I, I'll stand by my statement. I believe in 2024, more money will be converted from fiat to Bitcoin than the previous 15 years. That's a big ass statement but I believe it. And it's because most of the increase in the market cap of Bitcoin is not new money, right? There, there's been a lot of money that got converted over time, but there are people who mined, you know, 10 years ago, they never added any more fiat. It's just that value went up because people are buying and selling, you know, on the margin, plug for on the margin. Uh, and... So, but I do think there's going to be those citadel walls that have been erected by the overlords at Vanguard and Bank of America. And, you know, Ms. Warren picked up the phone, said, don't you let your clients buy this. That will pass because they're going to get, you know, they're going to have a bunch of ACATs, right? People are going to take their money away. Now, someone did make a good point. They said, no, 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 Vanguard wants to be the old people's firm. They don't want all these newbies. They don't want, and that's probably accurate. I know yeah. the management team there. That's probably accurate. But you know what? Here's the sad, sad fact. No firm that has ever done that 
has survived because we're human. We all have a finite life. And if you do not regenerate your brand, your image, your cohort of users, you will disappear. We don't talk about Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith anymore, do we? Where Pierce, Fenner, and Smith go? Long gone. We don't talk about E.F. Hutton anymore, do we? There was a time when E.F. Hutton, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, right? We don't talk about E.F. Hutton anymore. So if you don't change with the times, and I believe Vanguard will go the way of the dodo if they don't change their approach. But that's just my opinion. I'm entitled. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you on this. I think uh, I agree with you on this. It's Vanguard's brand and they've made a decision. They're also, you know, it has to be said, if you look at the AUM of Vanguard versus BlackRock, BlackRock is still the king, but Vanguard, I mean, the slope of the two lines is Vanguard is starting to catch up. So clearly they've, they've got something right. But I, you know, I, I used to be very concerned and, and worry about this and is, you know, are we ever going to get these people on our side? And I, I just I just think that it just takes a long time. I've resigned myself to the fact that a, a large portion of people will never uh, fully end up grokking this, but it doesn't really matter in the same way that a ton of people still today don't grok the internet and think that Amazon is, you know, no, one bad day away Michael, from failing. This is, it doesn't, it no longer bothers me. So this I, is why there's this, yeah. this cartoonist, I can't remember her name, Lena, something, Lena, something, but she makes these, these cute cartoons that everybody's seen of the, the little Bitcoiner uh, carrying the big Bitcoin. And she has this great one that I love. So it's four panels and the top panel on the left-hand side is the millionaire. And the millionaire's got a mansion and a Lambo and the Bitcoiner is homeless. Then the second panel, the millionaire's got a nice house, no Lambo, and the Bitcoiner's got a little shack. So the first one was, you know, 2005, then 2010. And then the third panel, 2020, the millionaire's got a little shack and the Bitcoiner's got, I mean, I got a, yeah, got a, uh, no, got a nice house and the Bitcoiners got a nice house. So they're roughly equivalent. 2040, the millionaires got a little tiny shack with an outhouse and the, mil- and the Bitcoiners got a castle. And there's a girl saying, can you believe he has a whole Bitcoin? And, that's, awesome. and that's where we are, right? If you go back to the beginning of a Bitcoin, one Bitcoin would have bought you stick of gum, right? A couple years later, it would have bought you a can of, you know, fruit cocktail to put in your shopping cart. A couple years later, it would have bought you the bottom layer of the shopping cart. Today, it will buy you a really nice EV. Someday, it'll buy you a nice house. And it's not because Bitcoin changed. It's because the currency we denominated in continues to get worse. And so that's why everyone, and I do mean everyone, and every client of every one of these firms will eventually get that. I love this. And I this is immodest and, and I probably people are going to yell at me for being such a, a cocky asshole. Um, but I got great joy yesterday in that a bunch of people were tweeting around this thing saying that, you know, today, uh, it's deemed risky to have Bitcoin. Tomorrow, all these advisors, it's going to be risky to not have Bitcoin. And so I pulled up a video I did in 2018 saying those exact words that, look, over the next decade, it was going to become fiduciarily, you would be derelict in duty as a fiduciary if you didn't own Bitcoin. Mm. And we're halfway there. And five years from now, if you don't own Bitcoin, if you work at Vanguard, if you work at Fidelity, if, you, if, you, if you're a financial advisor and you don't own it, you will be derelict to duty. Full stop. I agree with parts of that. Let, let me ask you, let me ask you this as a question. Gold's been, gold is famously underowned by institutional investors. 
why do you think that is? And the other thing about gold that the gold people love to say, right? This is the famous knock from the gold people against Bitcoin. Gold's been around for 5,000 years, 10,000, whatever it is, however long you want to go back. Well, (laughs) here's a way to, if gold's been around for 5,000 years, everyone who wanted gold had a lot of opportunity to buy it, but most people didn't. Why do you, why do you think that is? Um, because, well, a couple of reasons. One, um, they chose other stores of value, real estate, collectibles, art, whatever. Two, actually a very large number of people own gold. They don't really talk about it, but surprisingly, a large number do because it's in a lot of places. Remember the ETF, the gold ETF has how many billions of dollars? I mean, $137 billion. So that's a lot. Um, And there's all kinds of mining, you know, industrial materials, ETFs and mutual funds that own it on your behalf that you don't even really know. You know, people have money with Peter Schiff for well, God knows why. Um, and his Euro Pacific fund, he's got a big chunk of it. And so there are lots of people that that own it on people's behalf, even if they don't own it. Now, not everybody walks around with Krugerrands in their pants, like this guy I knew for years. He, he always, you know, had 10 Krugerrands because he's like, you know, never know when you're going to need them. And not everybody has a big old 27 kilogram you know, Australian gold coin under their desk, like Kyle Bass. But if you look at really wealthy people, Michael, all of them, not all, very, very large number of them own gold, like real physical gold, bars, coins, some of them got it in vaults. I mean, the Swiss banking industry revolved around that, that gold ownership and hoarding. And so again, the masses... Why is the math? Why is the person at the bottom of the pyramid not own gold? They don't have savings. They don't own stocks. They 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 pay rent. They they barely get by. They barely live. They're 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 borrowing on their credit cards. So yeah, they're not investing. And but they own gold indirectly because gold is the base layer of the monetary system. And so as Bitcoin replaces gold as that base layer, which I I think it will, because it's more divisible and and more portable, uh, equally scarce, everyone's going to own it in that sense, because the central banks will own it. Now, the fiat system will still exist. I know the maxis don't want to believe that, but the fiat system is going to exist for a while. But the really smart people are going to have a portion, one, three, five, whatever it is, in this asset that is your hedge. And it's the, one of the charts I love, and you know the the hundred trillion guy, he's he's taking little shots because the stock to flow model didn't work. Well, it's it isn't dead yet, but he has this great chart that I love, and it shows again log scale, log scale chart over time, fifteen years. Bitcoin was nothing, right? First few years, just science projects, and it had a lot of volatility, and but it, it tracks this forty five degree line which is a, you know, and the first thing it hit was the value of silver. So it surpassed the value of silver, like whatever it was, 2011, 2012. Then it hit diamonds. And now it's about 20% of the way towards gold. And up in the upper right-hand corner is real estate. And they all follow this same 45-degree line on the chart. Ultimately, you could make a really strong case that the average person won't own real estate the way our our generation owns it as a store of value to protect your wealth. They'll own Bitcoin. And I have this great chart that I use all the time, the digital divide. And on the left-hand side, you got these two boomers. They're really old boomers, but they're, they're buying the stocks and bonds from the lemonade stand on the right-hand side. You got all the youngsters buying buying Bitcoin. And you've heard me say this before. Ask anyone over 35, who's your broker? UBS, Merrill Lynch, whatever, Vanguard. Okay. How much gold do you have? I don't know. Three, 4%, whatever. 
How much Bitcoin do you have? Ah, zero. It's a Ponzi. You're listening to a Peter Schiff guy. How often do you use DeFi? What the hell is that? Ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? I don't have a broker. I mean, I got a Robinhood account. Okay. How much gold do you have? Ah, zero. Peter Schiff, Boomer Rocks, zero. How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. It's a really big percentage. And here's the thing. Average 35-year-old today doesn't have a lot of wealth. There are plenty that do, but the average 35-year-old doesn't have a lot of wealth. Average 65-year-old has a lot of wealth. Now, again, not everybody, but the average, pretty good number. I can guarantee you one thing. Most of what I say, <laughs> conjecture, speculation, whatever. But I can guarantee you one thing. In 30 years, every one of those 35-year-olds, except the ones that pass away, will be 65. And every one of those 65-year-olds, most of them will be gone. And that wealth will have changed hands. And here's the thing. I will argue that this generation, 35 and down, they are going to own digital assets as a portion of their portfolio and as an increasing number, the, the lower you get. So my grandkids, one, three, and five, they'll never have a leather wallet. They'll never know paper money. They will only own digital stores of value. That's my belief. I agree. Um, I've got two, one, one additional layer though for folks to maybe think about. And what I would, if you were to zoom in on that 35 year old generation, so the same exercise that you just went through with 65 versus 35, if you ask the 35 year old, maybe they own Bitcoin. But if you ask someone who's 18 or 25, Bitcoin is a boomer rock and they own ETH. Yeah. Uh, and, and here's the, the, the point. first, so, so, so what, take your, take your point that gold, gold is the largest, you know, uh, money in the world, really, if we're ignoring some of the fiat distortion, it's, it's a massive, it's a massive asset, massive success. But that first answer that you gave, the way that I would summarize that is substitutions, right? Not everyone's going to own gold. They'd rather have this other substitution yeah. for a store of wealth, yeah. art, housing, whatever. And sometimes because you can live in a house, you can't live in your block of gold, yeah, some, it's nice to look at art. You don't really want to hang gold on your wall. That'd be very gauche. Yep. So yep. there are these there are these sorts of properties that determine one store of value versus another. And this is the problem I've I've had for a while with, you know, when people just scream at you, twenty one million hard caps. Like, yes, you can't make any more Bitcoin. Actually, technically, if everyone decided we wanted to make more Bitcoin, sure. we could do that. Yeah, but but what you can all what it ignores this rule of of law and commodities, which is people will find substitutions. You know, it's every, everyone won't, there's this There's this idea that everyone's just like, I have to buy this Bitcoin, it's the only one. People will look for cheaper substitutions. That's been the story of alternatives to Bitcoin, altcoins, um, yeah. for a long period of time. And that's why Bitcoin dominance, Bitcoin is a percentage of overall crypto to market. A point, to a point that's absolutely true, but silver is another precious metal that caught on for a while. The problem is it's just it's too unwieldy. Gold is denser and you have to carry less to get the same value. So silver, and for a while, it had its run, you know, silver doubloons and things like that. Um, platinum definitely could have made a dent in gold, pun intended, but, but it didn't. Um, partly because it's just, too tough. There's only two places to really get it. And it's controlled mostly by the Russians. And so just never did. So there, there are, I totally agree with you. There, there's the potential for substitutions. I think the difference between crypto and Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm you know, people say you're a shit coiner. I, I, I like crypto. I, I think there are crypto projects that are technology that are, are legit and they're going to do really interesting things. But I, I do think there can only be one digital gold and we have it. And while you could say, well, my grandkids are going to think Bitcoin's a boomer rock and, and they're going to speculate in, you know, whatever altcoin comes up. This is my own personal belief. Meme coins are entertainment. They're not really stores of value. They're they're short-term Ponzi schemes. And and meme stocks have existed forever. From pieces of paper like East India Company 500 years ago 
to little, you know, ticker symbols to, you know, penny stocks in Canada to, I mean, we've had memes forever. You know, people didn't invent them now. They, they, they go viral faster because of the internet, but, but th- there have always been places where you could buy a tulip bulb or uh, a silly, you know, stock on the, tel- on the uh, uh, Canada Stock Exchange. And, and those, those always go away because there's no value. There's no, there's no real thing there. But ETH is different, right? At least so far. Now I saw Jack Maulers. I love Jack and you know, we're investors with Jack. But you know, he tried to eviscerate ETH the other day on, on TV and, and people got all mad at him. And he said, well, what did I say that wasn't true? I'm like, well, okay. Actually, what you said was true, but it misses some of the point, which is if enough people build on that technology platform, even though you don't have to like it, and you can say it was pre-mined and it was given to a bunch of friends. Yeah, that's all true. But if it's used by enough people and, and becomes a base layer for enough technology that allows you to transfer value, store value, whatever, then, then it'll have some value. Um, but that exact speech just bothered me because I, okay, th- the, again, the story of crypto is very specific technical arguments about the architecture of the network that get extrapolated into moral arguments where it makes no sense. And the only way to engage these moral arguments is to get dragged down into the smut of the people that peddle them. I object so strongly to that. I, I, it really, I, and here's, here's I why. The, the, reason, the reason I don't like it is because one, it's not going to onboard anyone. No one else cares. Look at look at the ETF. Look at the ETF thing that BlackRock put out. If you want a peek into the future, there is your peak. Yeah. So, a this whole thing about a pre mine. I mean, you sound like a lunatic rambling on the internet. That's what you sound like to everyone. Else. I don't disagree with you at all. I, I don't. And it's like, and it's like, aren't we on the same team here? This is, you know. Each one of these ecosystems can learn from the other. I mean, you've everyone is optimized for their own little thing. And guess what? Blockchains are all very similar when you get down to the core. It's it's a blessing that Bitcoin now has other ecosystems that are optimizing for different things. It can learn from them. It is learning from them. We have ordinals now. There are drive chains that have been in the works for since 2016 that are finally actually working. And in a lot of ways, Bitcoin is now downstream of Ethereum in these, and Ethereum is now downstream of other things in Solana. All of this is good. None of this should be a threat. We are still such a small industry. This infighting is ridiculous. I hate it. I'm with you. I'm with you. Look, technology isn't linear. It's not monolithic. And um, yeah, people can say, all you you did is change a couple things and, and fork the original. Sure. But that's the nature of blockchains. They can be forked. They can be enhanced. You can add things to them. You can subtract things from them. You can change the governance structures. Blockchain is a technology. And, and, and again, this is, this is why I spend my chapter three and, and the rest of my active career here is it's super exciting. And the wealth creation opportunity is massive. And to your point, there's enough to go around. And so, yes, do I think Bitcoin won digital gold? Yep. I believe that. Check. Next. I agree with that. You know, I agree with that too. And I, I think, do I think it's possible Bitcoin could be the base layer, settlement layer for all assets? It's possible. Likely. Not sure, but it's possible. Um, you know, there's some people who don't like that, right? Luke Dash Jr. wants to, you know, censor that and, and not allow that and get rid of ordinals. And look, Luke's a smart guy, <laughs> better coder than I am. Um, so there are, but all this is positive. All of the fact that really smart people are coming into this industry that are building the new internet, the new web, is amazing. Web one. Two trillion, two trillion dollars out of thin air, the good kind, not print money out of thin air, build stuff out of thin yeah. air, out of your brain, out of ideas, 
And we're using it right now. TCP IP is awesome. Took 70 years to get awesome, but it's awesome. Love it. We're using it right now. I don't know how it works. It makes no sense to me that a bunch of little packets are going down multiple different wires and coming into your computer all at the same time. And I look, well, I don't look great, but I look normal. That, that just doesn't make sense to me, but I don't have to worry about it. You always knock yourself, Mark. You always no, 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 no. I, I, it's because, it's because you know, you have these experiences, right? And, and look, I, I am who I am. And, um, but I, I had di- a breakfast with a friend of mine. He says, wow, you've really gone all gray, haven't you? I'm like, dude, nice to see you rude. too. Yeah, I like, rude, brother. You know, I like whatever, but, but I, I embrace it. But um, my point is that there's going, Web 2, 5 trillion. That's more than two. And we created some of the biggest, most monolithic, maybe evil, but, but incredible companies in history. Now we got Web 3 coming. How much? 10, 15, 20? Because it's not linear. It's exponential. And we're building on that better tech. And so we're going to unlock things that have been locked up and been monopolized. And now it's like decentralized Twitter versus Twitter. Okay. I tried all of them and they just don't work because they don't have the critical mass. I mean, Farcaster, I love it. The idea of it, but I get like seven likes versus millions of impressions on Twitter. So as much as people hate Twitter, and I'm never calling it X, by the way, Twitter, people, and people can call whatever they want. I don't care. Um, I still call the University of Chicago GSB. You know, all deference to David Booth, right? Who gave $300 million to rename the school. But to me, it was GSB because that's what it was called when I was there. And uh, I'll give him credit for it being the Booth School now. But for me, it's the GSB. And um, I just think fighting doesn't make any sense. It's, it's not a good use of time. You don't have to embrace the other project. You don't want to spend your time in ETH or Sol, so fine. I think the people who are working on Sol have a great point. <laughs> Maybe. They're like, if Ethereum was invented today, would anybody use it? It's an interesting question, right? I think they would. It's no, no, the, no, no, no. I mean, that's, that's, that's I, right. so, I think you're right, but 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 it's an interesting question because if, if you're just if you're just trying to optimize on fees, on gas fees, mm-hmm. you would. They've got a problem. They've got a problem but, with that. No, no, no. But if you optimize on uptime and congestion and, and a bunch of other things, and you actually look at the tech, you'd be like, it isn't just about cheap. It isn't just about fast. It's about accurate. It's about consistent. So anyway. There's a interesting dichotomy here. The blockchain, arch- all, all the things that blockchain used to do, which is data availability, execution, settlement, consensus, that all belongs within one, one architecture within Bitcoin, one instantiation of code, Bitcoin core, right? That is the spec for Bitcoin. Ethere- in Ethereum land and many other blockchains, they are... They are basically uh, unbundling these different actions that a blockchain yeah. does, and uh, what it is, what it is, what's happening is people are starting to wonder: Well, where do the network effects accrue? Because especially in a world where there are multiple blockchains and you can export the asset ETH, which is the native token of the Ethereum protocol, well, okay, does the network actually accrue to the network effects accrue to the protocol or to the asset? And as it turns out. They, those two things might not actually be complementary. They might be conflicting because the thing that makes ETH or Bitcoin good as a money is that it's actually not particularly performant. It's very robust, very decentralized, very low hardware and bandwidth requirements. And that makes it good, right? You've limited the surface area of what it can do, but then it's kind of a crappy performance on the network. And right. so that is the the challenge that ETH is in more it's it's a more proximate challenge for ETH today, but it's a challenge for Bitcoin as well because the whole uh, tokenomics of Bitcoin require essentially the price of Bitcoin to go up because if Bitcoin does not go up, then miners aren't getting paid enough fees and it it's their security budget. And yeah. so and so what's going to happen is this is what's happening with ordinals, which is the best use yeah. case, 
uh, best thing to happen in my in my opinion. Transactions are driving, you know, they're dri- they're putting transactions into the pool. Miners are getting paid more, but it's going to drive fees up too. And so this is coming for every blockchain. No one has nailed it. Everyone has trade offs. Anyway, we, no, we can but to that point it, because it's technology. Yeah, and technology demands compute. It demands power. It demands, you know, an in, a, a structure, an infrastructure, and and there are a lot of ways to go about it. But to I love the way you say it, right? There are these structural components that are just the same, and you can mm-hmm. choose to package them. You can unbundle them, but that's been the nature of technology forever. Right? You don't have to have. So well, look, look what we're doing. We're back to to cars, right? You can have internal combustion engine, or you can create the electricity somewhere else and store it on the chassis. Two fundamentally different. It's the same functionality. I'm driving a car, so but you can approach the the technological solution in different ways, and you know at, at the end, as as everything moves to digital. You know, this was the other one again, immodestly. You know, Larry Fink says, yeah, we're going to tokenize everything. Like, yeah, some of us have been saying that for a long time, Larry, right? Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity. I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm going to show you this. Mark, as always, best hour of my week. And guys, come see me. And if you got, if you're going to DAS, come see. We're going to be hanging out the night before. Uh, fun, fun uh, roast um, night. Hang out with, uh, with Empire folks as well. So it's going to be a blast. Awesome. Uh, come hang out and. Mark, see you soon, my friend. Awesome. Be well. Talk to you soon.